So hello, folks. Thank you so much for joining us today. I think this is the last session on the Higher Ed Tech Student uh, Reactor Series. I recognize some names, uh, some quite famous names on the list of attendees who I follow on Twitter, but like, you know, would never feel brave enough to say hello to on Twitter. And they're watching this, so like there's no pressure at all. But uh, if uh, you are a student, and maybe you're studying computer science or computing or any course with some coding on it. And whether you're in Sweden or I see someone's in Australia or whether you're a professor or a lecturer or an industry practitioner, I hope there's something in here that you'll find useful today. I am going to go at a reasonable pace, but I do have a hard stop. It's the hardest stop I'll ever have giving a talk because Satch is on after me at a big announcement that I'm sure you all want to go to in an hour's time. So we're going to have a hard stop in an hour. So I'm going to get right into it. I'm talking about AI for accessibility today and I'm presenting without captions on purpose. If you find it hard to understand me, either because of the language I speak or this strange accent I have, which is an Irish accent, well, then you can switch on captioning on your own teams, uh, hopefully to help you understand me. Uh, I do apologize if my accent's hard to follow. I'll try to speak as clearly as possible. So who am I and why should you listen to me at all? Well. I'm an academic evangelist for Microsoft, and I don't think we have evangelists anymore anywhere else in Microsoft. Uh, it's an old term. I think nowadays it would be an advocate, which sounds even cooler. I used to be a software engineer, and then I became a computer science lecturer. I taught Java for 100 years, and then I became an academic evangelist in Microsoft, and I've been doing that for about eight years. Mostly, mostly I teach students about Azure and AI, but other things as well. And you'll notice today I am talking about AI, but I'm also talking about accessibility. And that's something that's very important to me personally as well. Now, uh, if you're a Twitter type of person, I mean, that's very cool. I'm Howell underscore MSFT. And, you know, I'd love you to follow me. If you're a LinkedIn type of person, or maybe you're both, I'm Stephen Richard Howell on LinkedIn. What am I going to talk about today? Well, I'm going to start off just a little bit about why accessibility is for everyone, not just what many people think accessibility is, something that you might have to add to your product or your, your project because it's a requirement for people who maybe they need a screen reader or something. You don't know much about it and it's not really a problem for you. So you just add that button in and it kind of works. You kind of tested it. Not a big deal. But I'm going to argue that actually your accessibility is for everyone and it needs to be built into your software, not just bolted on. I'm going to be using Azure Cognitive Services to do that. So you don't actually have to know any AI or ML in the formal sense. You don't have to have done a module on it. You don't have to know anything about statistics and models and all that good stuff. Now, I highly recommend you do learn that, but I'm not going to expect you to know any of that today. I'm going to be focusing on computer vision. And you'll see why in a little while. And I do have a code demo. If you're not a coder, don't panic. It's not very much code. I'll be going through it bit by bit, and you will absolutely be able to do this yourself if you've done any coding. And even if you haven't, I think you'll be able to take a first stab at it. I'm going to use Python, which, you know, I'm going to be upfront with all the programmers here. Python is a new language for me in a way. I've only been learning it for a few years. When I started programming, the introductory programming language was called assembly language programming when I went to university. And if you don't know what that is, that's, you know, you're OK. You don't have to know what that is. And then we had a really easy language called C++. And eventually this language called Java came out and then Python became popular. And the main thing you need to know about programming languages, there'll always be another one. There'll always be a cool new technology stack, whatever it is to learn and being able to learn a new one is much better than saying I'm an expert on one thing only because that thing might become, you know, not in demand someday. So being able to learn new ones always good, but it's hard. So I'm still learning Python and maybe you'll learn with me. So to cover the, the whole, you know, why am I talking to you about this? You may have heard the statistic about 7.8 billion people in the world and the WHO reckons 1 billion of those 
have a disability which affects them, their home, their work and their school. And sometimes disabilities are permanent, temporary or situational. I mean, someone who is carrying a screaming baby and trying to scroll one handed on their phone for music on YouTube that will be soothing for the baby. They have a situational disability. As soon as they put that crying baby down, they won't need to use their phone one handed. However, the baby might object to that and cry even more. So sometimes we have to think about a disability when someone's using our software as something which, you know, is situational. It won't always be there, but if the feature's there and makes life easier for your users, it can only be a good thing. And, and this is one that gets most people, a disability can be visible or invisible. Now, if I see someone coming into my building to have a meeting with me in a wheelchair, and my building is not wheelchair accessible, I can see there's going to be an issue because I have not made my building accessible. But if I can't see that my user has a disability, like I, I have a disability, but it's invisible, then what happens when I go to use the software and it doesn't, or I go to meet the person or I go to do the thing and they say, oh, we didn't realize we had to cater to you because your disability is invisible. I don't want to have to go and tell everyone I have this disability. Can you help me? And 70% of disabilities are invisible. So your software engineers, your software developers, your product designers, you're making cool stuff. OK, but if you think about accessibility, are you making accessible features for everyone? Or are you saying, oh, this is only for people who have this particular diagnosed disability. They're the only market. They'll be interested. No one else will. Because many people are using software accessibility features all the time in lots of different software across mobile, desktop, laptop, web. And it's not actually aimed at them, but it makes their life easier in some way and it makes the, them more productive with the software and happier to use it. So it's, you know, they're, they are not your expected market, but the market's actually everyone. So it's important to see disability as a strength, particularly in the workplace, because Many people like me are struggling to, you know, adapt to the way certain people like to work. And that can make it really hard when you know you can be productive and you can know you can code really well as long as you're allowed to do it in your way. To say, actually, I actually have a disability that makes it difficult for me to code in this way you want me to is really difficult. Whereas if your manager, your boss, or your company says, Wow, the way you can hyper focus on coding, I'm going to let you do that. I'm going to make it so that that environment best suits you. What features in your IDE do you need to be able to do that? Well, they're recognizing my disability as a strength that actually lets me be more productive than usual. Now, I just want to focus on students for a second. OK, so if you're a student, I'm talking to you particularly. We survey students and a lot of students say they're unaware or unaffected by any disability, which is great. OK, but they're only considering physical disabilities. I remember I said 70 percent of disabilities are invisible and neurodiversity is awareness is growing annually, not just among students, but amongst the companies and educators of those students. And that neurodiversity is actually led to neurodiverse hiring programs and companies. And accessibility is by creating better experiences for everyone. If you're going to write some software and you're going to add in an accessibility feature, you say to your professor, I'm adding this in for everyone, not just for a percentage who might need it. Everyone will be able to benefit from this feature. That's why I'm going to the trouble of adding it in. And during COVID, like Microsoft saw a huge increase in inqui inquiries to our disability answer desk and to our dyslexia tools. but those tools were available and those services were available before COVID. It's just the awareness of them had changed and the increases were huge. So it shows that there's a demand out there. And if they're seeing the demand, the demand would be in your software too. Now, let's say you're saying, well, no, I'm more of a business person. I'm going to be the entrepreneur of the year in Sweden. <laughs> well, it's still good business design, not just a good thing to do and the right thing to do, but still good business practice. Because if you have a billion people who need accessible features in software, do you want to reduce your target market by a billion people? Of course not. 
So it's important not to miss out on those things. And that's why we say accessibility can't be a button where you click and say, this is the accessibility button. It has to be infused in your application that you're developing. But that's hard to do. So how do we make it easier to do? And let's go for that. Why should I bother learning this? OK, well, hopefully you want to get a job if you're a student when you graduate. And I was shocked to read the other day that by 2025, which is not far away, 75% of the global workforce will be millennials. Now, I'm far too old to be millennial, unfortunately. But isn't it interesting that millennials report and when they're surveyed that one of their most important things choosing an employer is that the employer reflects their values and their culture and diversity and inclusion is in the top of that list. And I see that myself when I'm hiring young graduates. They are carefully selecting the company that matches their you know, culture and values. So we have to recognize and embrace that. You can't say, do you know what? I'm not hiring anyone who doesn't think exactly like me. Well, maybe you need to update your thinking and realize that the world is changing and by embracing it, you can be uh, an employer of choice. So I'm going to now switch to a demo. So I do have slides because this is very, very fancy and important reactor talk. So I have PowerPoint slides, but I'm not really a PowerPoint you know, lecture. I'm usually a show the demo lecture. So I have a little demo for you. I have a couple, but I'm going to start with OneNote. Now, you, hopefully you've heard of OneNote. It's a free app. It's available on every platform. And, you know, it's not that exciting. It's something like students use. Well, hopefully you're a student and you've used it. Well, I actually use OneNote for everything uh, in terms of keeping track of my life. But the really interesting thing about OneNote is recently it's been infused over the last couple of years with lots of different AI features. But they don't slap you around the head saying, this is AI, this is AI. It's just there and it just works and it's just doing things that make life easier, making things more accessible. So I want to show you a few of those features now. I'm not going to show you all of them, there's too many, but I want to show you a few. So I'm going to uh, switch from my slides now to uh, OneNote. There we go. And I'm going to just go up here to the top and say the main features that are in this OneNote to demonstrate are things like text extraction from images, which is aimed at blind and low vision users, but is actually really useful to anyone learning a language, particularly if it's an additional language. Customizable text presentation. You might have heard of immersive reader, which is a way to make text easier to read, aimed at dyslexia and low vision users. Text to speech. You know, that is an interesting one, which uh, I hope you will not object to a, a demo in a language which I bet no one speaks but me, but it's coming up. And then speech to text. What if I can't type and I want to dictate to the computer? Well, we've had voice dictation software for years, but we have new voice dictation software now that uses AI, recognizes our punctuation and learns our accents and allows you to give better dictation, which is really cool. And then, of course, uh, text translation. And I'm very proud of the text translation because it's recently added the Irish language. So the Irish language is something that uh, was not available for translation in OneNote, but it is available now and I'm very excited to show that. So I'm going to, if you don't mind, folks, skip over the dictate. I will just mention, because usually at this point I would dictate a poem or something, but you know, uh, I don't think you need me to do that. But I am going to say is that the AI listens for me saying things like period or full stop, depending on whether I'm speaking American or British English, comma and question mark, and it will insert those. That's that's not too exciting. You've probably seen things like that before. If I go to text extraction from images, I want to just demonstrate a cool little AI feature which goes unnoticed, but Teachers use it all the time, and I think it's really cool. So this is actually a book, um, Hannibal on Holiday. I have it here on my desk. It's from 1976, the year I was born. It's by Raymond Howe, and it's published by Ladybird Books. And here's a photograph of the first page. And if I right click, uh, you can hopefully see it there. Hannibal is a hamster when he goes on holidays. Um, it's quite an exciting book. 
Uh, I'm sure you've read it. Now, if I right click and go to copy text from the picture, that will put in my clipboard, I'll just paste it here. I'll right click and I'll paste the text. And you'll notice that the cap, oh, sorry, it's going too fast. Sorry about that. The capitalization is kept Hannibal and Holiday, Hannibal and Holiday. Capital smell, capital smell. Even the punctuation and everything else is good. Now, of course, it's a clear photograph. The font's nice. I just took it with my phone now, it's not with a fancy camera or anything. But it's able to recognize that text and do OCR and pull it out. Now, at no point does it say this is an AI feature or this is an accessibility feature. It just does it. It's just there. It's running in the background. It uses a web service to do it all. And the user doesn't realize that they've just done some very cool AI things. Now, moving quickly on to Immersive Reader, Immersive Reader makes it easy to have that text read out to me or to make it easier for me to read if I have dyslexia or low vision. So how, how does it work? Well, here's the best bit of the demo. If I click Hannibal on holiday, and there's the text that you just saw me do. Normally, if I was finding that hard to read, the text is a bit small, I would zoom in if I knew how to do that. And I'm zooming in here by using my keyboard and my mouse. Okay, so the text is bigger now, but the problem I have is that the text is spaced really badly. OK, it's really stuck together. I find it very hard to read and I really need it spaced. I don't like black on white. I'd really like to change the colors. And, you know, I'm learning English, so I'm not sure which bits are nouns and verbs. And I'd really like that made clearer. Now, a really cool thing to be able to do here would be to have all of that applied. And you could do that. You could go into Word and you could change the background and, you know, make, make the font bigger. But if you then show that to someone else, they would go, why did you change it all? It was fine when it was black and white. What's why are you doing all that? And you might want to say, because it could be your teacher or a fellow student. Well, I have dyslexia. I had to do all that. You, you just might want to discuss that with them. So this is a personalized way to change the text that you have to read into a format that makes it easier for you to read. And it doesn't change the underlying document. Now, if I click view an immersive reader, you should see that all of the decoration and buttons and everything vanished on my screen. I now just have the text. I have a go back arrow. I have three options up in the top right hand corner and I have a big play button. Now, I shared my audio earlier on, so do warn me if this audio is not working. But if I click on my audio settings, I can see it's a female voice at normal one speed. And I click play. Hannibal on holiday. Hannibal the hamster knew that there was something unusual about the day. Both of the children were up before he went to bed. Being a hamster, Hannibal always slept in the daytime and woke up at night. But on the first morning of the holiday, it was quite impossible for him to settle down. He could almost smell the excitement in the air. Now, of course, it doesn't say it. But that natural sounding voice isn't actually an Irish woman who recorded that. It is an AI voice based on lots of different accents to build a model that sounds natural. It's a service from Microsoft's Azure Cognitive Services. Um, it's a speech service and it's called a, a neural, neural voice, as in neurons in your brain. Now, it sounds very natural to me, much more natural than the old robotic voices. But maybe I don't want it read to me. Maybe I want it easier to read myself. So I can click on my options buttons and I can change the font size here just with a slider and it does not alter the underlying document in any way. I can change the spacing. I can change the font. I can change the colors and no one will know that this is how I like to consume my text. I can then do natural language processing to highlight where the syllables break and where the nouns and verbs are and adjectives and adverbs if I want. And then I can do some AI translation and corpus translation. Um, you know, you can get better results if you have the right type of uh, models. But the one I'm very happy to show you here is an Irish model. So this is a feature where we can translate the entire document into another language. It also has Klingon for the Star Trek fans, but Irish is probably less spoken than Klingon, but I'm going to show you Irish. Now, I'm betting there's no one here who speaks Irish. OK, it would be cool if there was, but I speak some Irish, but not everyone does. So you don't have to speak Irish, but I want you to listen here because I have a male and female voice. 
I haven't done anything except say I want the document in Irish. And now I click play. Hannibal or Sira. Via is ik Hannibal on hamster gra rud egen nyav ganach fin law the unverch the naposh the suus sullen yachishe alaba. Now, if you speak Irish like I do, that's Irish, and she has a lovely neutral accent that makes it easy to understand. Compared to my teachers, I would much prefer to have had this teacher, but you know, I was just born about 35 years too late for that. But the cool thing about this is, is nowhere does it say, this is AI, there's machine learning happening here. Did you know that? It's just an accessible feature that people who are logged in to OneNote with their office account can go in and use all these features. So I even have a last page is, where is the AI? Well, believe it or not, all those things you just saw was sending data to a service on the cloud, you know, where's the cloud, it's up in the sky. It's actually a data center and it was receiving the information, doing what was requested and sending it straight back. Now I see a question, and by the way, folks, I have two monitors and sometimes I miss the questions. And I see a question, does it support Arabic? It's a really good question. I don't know. I don't speak Arabic, so I'm going to go in and find out. So I click on Immersive Reader. I go over to my languages and I'm going to show that we have a lot of languages and we have Arabic Egyptian and Arabic Saudi Arabia. So um, does anyone want to tell me which one they'd like me to try? I, I, I'm not actually sure how different it would be. Khaldun, do you want to tell me which one you'd like me to try? You can type it into the chat if you have a choice. Saudi, okay, so I'll go with that one and I'll say translate the whole document and it does that. Now, I'm going to need your help to tell me if that's right, but I'm going to hit play. Hannibal fi Opla. Hannibal al hamster yarifu anna hunaka shay'an ghayr adiyin hawla al yawm. Kana kullum min al atfal hatta qabla an yadhaba ila sarir. Now, she sounds very natural to me, but you know, I don't speak Arabic, so I don't know how accurate it was, but I hope um, it sounded uh, accurate to you. And the cool thing about these models is they're running on the cloud, so you don't have to ins download and install a big update to get better languages. They just improve over time. Irish just appeared one day and I could select it, which was really cool. Now, oh, th thank you, Khaldun. Now, Khaldun, I'd like you to do the following thing. You can get one note on your own computer. If you have an Office 365 account and you're logged in, it'll sync all your notebooks and you can put some text in and see how well it does going from Arabic to say English, English to Arabic or whatever language you want and see how well the AI voices read them out. And I think you'd uh, the, the thing I want you to take away from this session today is if you like what it does, you can do that in code yourself very cheaply and very easily. So all these features I'm showing you here, they're not secret features that Microsoft doesn't let anyone have. We sell them as a service on our cloud platform. It's called Azure, is our cloud, Azure, Azure. I'm not sure how I'm meant to pronounce it. I'm pronouncing it the Irish way. But cognitive services is the sub part inside Azure. And all the stuff I'm showing you here, including immersive reader, the way it changes it to look, is available as a service. You can write your programs to take advantage of these features. Nothing I'm showing you is a top secret, only Microsoft have it, and you have to work for Microsoft to be able to do it. It's a service you can use. OK, so that's the, the OneNote bit finished. And um, I want to show you next, say say bye bye to OneNote. Because the, the thing I want you to take away from that demo is these features are here. Kids are using them. Teachers are using them. And none of them are going, oh, I'm using an AI feature or I'm using an accessibility feature. They're just using the features of the software that make it easier to do things. And that's kind of cool. So what I'm going to do next is minimize that. Go back to PowerPoint. There we are. And the next thing, next slide is PowerPoint. Now, I know I'm in PowerPoint. So how am I going to do a demo of PowerPoint when I'm in PowerPoint? Well, watch. Have you ever used PowerPoint and inserted a picture into it? And I'm going to demonstrate that when I load up a new sort of blank copy of PowerPoint, you know, there we go. And I'm going, oh, it's already telling me it's got design ideas. I really need design ideas. Um, I, I don't have a design um, ability myself, but I'm going to go over to insert and I'm going to, sorry, I just have to move the, the other PowerPoint slideshow out of the way. I'm going to select picture and I'm going to say from this device. So 
where am I going to install it from? So I'm going to go here to Vision. And I have a little picture here of Molly. Ah, there you go, Molly. Now, you'll notice that it says alt text at the bottom, a picture containing grass, sky, outdoor and little. That's that's not really what that picture contains. So I realized that because I'm going to be sharing this with my friend Donald and Donald is blind. He's a professor of computer science, but he's blind. He's not going to know that I have a picture of Molly there in the slide. So I go to edit alt text. Now, oops, sorry, I, I don't have a mouse cursor because I'm presenting on the other one. Now, when I go to edit all text, you notice it says a picture containing grass, sky, outdoor and little, which is no good. So what I should do here, if I'm a good content creator for my friend Donald, who's going to want to be able to consume these slides without ringing me up and saying, my screen reader says there's a picture, but what is the picture? You can't read it. Well, OK, so I should say a photo of uh, Molly. But maybe Donald doesn't know who Molly is. So I might say a photo of a little girl uh, sitting in a field. OK, that's, that's a pretty good description. Would you agree? It is a little girl. It's actually my daughter, Molly, when she was five. She's 10 now. It's her last day of school today. I'd say she's very excited. But just looking at that picture, if I said, is that a reasonable description? I'm going to send this deck to my friend. He's blind. Will that be a reasonable description? Yeah, I think so. However, I could ask Azure or PowerPoint in this case to generate a description for me. So I'll do that. And it goes off, it sends the picture away and it comes back and it says, it tells me two things. It says it's a child sitting in a field. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that description. Do you agree with that description? Possibly you might you might have some improvements to suggest. But it also says that description was automatically generated with low confidence. In other words, the algorithms are not quite clear what's in that image. And they're saying mm, there's a lot of things going on, but this is what we think the caption is. But we're not that confident. That's that's not great confidence. It's still not bad, though, for hitting one button and being told that's what it is. And now I have alt text in my deck and you should do alt text whether you're on Twitter or whether you're in PowerPoint, you know that, but not everyone does. So being able to generate it automatically is nice. I want you to remember, though, the sequence of words. A child sitting in a field. OK. And the reason I'm asking you to do that will become obvious in a moment. So we say uh, goodbye to a child sitting in a field. And we won't save that. And we're back now to we have to resume our slideshow. There we go. So the next question I want to ask you, and this is the final part of what we're talking about today is, will that old text image caption feature be hard to code for our apps? Be it your college projects, your university capstone thesis, or maybe you're a developer and you are thinking of adding this in and you're not a student. Would that be hard to do? Well, I don't think so. I don't think you will after this either. So if you think, look, that sounds like it would be hard to do, you don't have to actually know any AI in ML. Like, it is really cool if you do know it and you'd probably be able to do a lot more cool things, but not everyone has time to become an ML expert. Not everyone has the resources to build their own models. So some big tech companies like Microsoft who have AI as a service say, well, you don't have to know any of that. If you send a picture to our service, we'll send back the caption for it. And if you're think that the confidence for the caption is high enough, you can use it. So you are then tasked with, OK, but that means I have to learn how to talk to your service. Is that going to be really complicated? Do I have to learn a special programming language? Like I heard Microsoft only does C Sharp, like an, and I like to use Java or Python or whatever. Well, the good news is that you can access this from just about any programming language, as long as it can talk to the, the internet and it can make what's called a RESTful API call. And that's just about every programming language. So that's the good news is, you know, there's probably a programming language out there that can't do this, but they're quite rare and, and probably very ancient. The next thing is that I'm only showing this as a console solution. Like it's 30 lines of code, runs on a console. You know, it, you literally give it an image and it gives you back the caption. But building it into your app is not much harder than that. You'd be able to go and maybe add it in 
to a, a web browser extension. Uh, Dr. Jen Looper was presenting to the Reactor series last week about creating extensions. I think she had two different sessions uh, for your web browser. Imagine right clicking your web browser, Azure Cognitive Services, what is this picture? And it tells you, this is what I think this is. That'd be kind of cool, but I'm not showing you that. I'm just giving you the idea that the code I have here, it does the operation, but it gives it back to you in a very simple way, prints it out onto the console. But there's nothing stopping you adapting that type of approach to wherever your apps are, whether they're running on uh, iOS, like the Seeing AI app, you might have heard of, an amazing app. It's in the uh, App Store on your iPhone and iPad. It's from a Microsoft developer called Sappy Shake, and it's just incredible stuff because it looks at a, a camera feed and identifies objects and tells you what it thinks it sees in the picture. And if you haven't heard of it, but you have an iPhone or an iPad, get yourself the Seeing AI app. It's absolutely amazing. But adding that in yourself starts with the simplest way to do it. That's what I'm going to show you now. So I'm going to be using the Computer uh, Vision API. Now, it gets lovely and complicated at this point because the API does lots of things. It can categorize an image under 86 categories. It can tag nouns and verbs and the positions of an object with the X, Y location and the width and the height of it. It can do all sorts of mad things and it's really cool, but we're going to do one simple thing. We are going to caption our images with a short descriptive sentence. Now, at this point, if you want to partake in a group activity where we learn about captioning, you can do that with me now. I'm going to do it talking to the screen and watching uh, the chat window. But if you just want to do that yourself or maybe offline or maybe not when I'm rabbiting on about it, I have no problem with you taking this link. It's active, it's public, and it lets you uh, do the activity we're going to do now. OK, so if you want to go off and do that yourself, I think um, I think it's already been shared earlier on by Eamon, but uh, you can absolutely do that. And if you would rather do it with us, and I think you should do it with us, I'm going to do that now. So I want you mentally, don't shout it out, describe in a short sentence the following photograph. And I'd like you to write it into the chat, but you don't have to, OK? So you've seen this picture before. I'm showing it to you again on purpose. And you already know that how the computer describes it. You know, it's a little girl sitting in the field, but I want you to describe it in a very short sentence. OK, and, you know, I know you could write about, you know, the clouds and the sky and the trees and the background and the round bales. If you know what a bale is, then you grew up on a farm like me. The thing is, is that I wanted a short sentence as possible. Now, if you see one, OK, there's a good one now. It's a young girl in blue clothing. It's identifying the color of the clothing sitting in a gold field. OK, so you've identified three main things. OK, you've identified there's a person and they're young and you think they're a girl. You've identified the main color, which is one blue clothing and the other is gold field. That's really good. Does anyone else want to try one? But shorter than that, even? can you go even shorter, but still accurate? I know people might be shy. So I'm going to show you three captions and I'm going to show you actually four captions. And the first one you've seen already, a little girl sitting in a field. OK, oh, we, we've got a good one. We've girl posing for a photo, though I don't think she was posing, but, you know, her daddy managed to catch her anyway. And uh, we've girl about five years of age leaning towards the camera, wearing a blue dress, sitting in a field. And that's absolutely accurate and excellent, but it's too long. See, the captions are usually shorter. So I'm going to show you four captions now, and I would like you to give me a thumbs up when you think you see the one that was written by a human. And I'll show you all four, and then I'll ask for a thumbs up on each one. Oh, sorry, not thumbs up, hands up. So a little girl sitting in a field, we know that was the computer. A child sitting in a field of wheat. A happy child sitting in a field. A girl sitting in a field of hay. Now, you know, the first one is from Azure. OK, but what I'm going to tell you next is that Azure can give you three different captions 
and the three different captions are based on whether you're using the last three versions of the API. The latest API is a particular number, but you can get the previous, whatever many. And I got the three previous API results for you, and I added one myself. So let's start with the first one. We know that's not the human one. So the second one is a child sitting in a field of wheat. Can we get a, a raised hand? If you click the little hand icon, okay, you uh, can raise a hand. And if you raise your hand, you think, you think that it's the second one, a child sitting in a field of wheat. No, no one else is raising their hand. Okay. And it's very hard to fool you guys. Okay, why? Okay, let's go with a happy child sitting in a field. Anyone want to raise their hand for that one? Oh, lots of hands going up. Now, who wants to tell me what they think is the key reason you think it's that one? The three hands that have gone up. Is there any particular reason you don't trust that one? And what about the people who think it's a girl sitting in a field of hay? Yeah, but it uses the word field up here too, yeah. Ah, so someone said it described the facial expression. And that is a feature of a different API to say someone's face looks happy or sad, but it's not this one. So you know, in these captions, you will not see things like happy and sad and all that. It just describes very factually what it thinks it sees. But isn't it interesting that three of these captions came from a computer algorithm? The first, the second, and the last one. Ignoring the happy one, wheat and hay are actually improvements on the very first one. So at some point after the first, a little girl sitting in a field, it changed to a child sitting in a field of wheat. And then recently it changed to a girl sitting in a field of hay because the models are getting better. Now, I'm going to make these slides available uh, for people because I would like them to do this exercise and you can do it with your friends, but I'm just going to show you a few more. So here are the three captions. The latest three versions of the API are called 3.0, 3.1 and 3.2. And you can see that the brackets is the percentage confidence. And the 3.0 algorithm was much more confident than the 3.1. But I would argue that the 3.1 was probably more accurate. And then it's a very small change for 3.2. One was for a picture and the other's for a photo. And I want you to think that we, in English, we might use those words interchangeably, but are they interchangeable? And here's a picture with no people, and you'll, it's gone from a body of water surrounded by trees to a river surrounded by trees, to a river with trees on the side, but not very confident. Again, I think there's a lot for us to think about just because the captioning system has a new model does not mean it will always be better for every type of image. It might be. It might be more accurate in one way and less accurate in another. And what about a painting? OK, so we have pictures with people, pictures with no people. But of course, I mean photographs with people and photographs with no people. Here we have a painting and of course, this painting is actually a, a Dutch painting. It looks like a cathedral. Um, I did look up the name of the painting, but I can't remember it right now. It's very hard. I think it's a view of the village of such and such. But looking at that, it says a castle on a cloudy day. Not bad. A painting of a castle on a hill with a river and people in the foreground, but only 35%. And then finally, a painting of a building in a river. Now, I would argue that the middle one is the most useful one if you were describing the picture. But maybe I'm wrong, but that's how I would argue. Now, if you are scanning old photographs, does it work with old black and white images? Yes, but look at the improvement over the last two years, say. A small clock tower in the middle of a body of water, kind of a little bit abstract, you know? Or a lighthouse on a rock outcropping in the ocean. Yeah, that's better. Or a lighthouse on a rocky cliff. Now, this is Sam. Sam is 13. Today's his last day of school and he's holding his pet chicken, one of his many pet chickens. Unfortunately, that chicken kind of stumped cognitive services. Now, unfortunately, at first it says, well, that's a person holding a dog. Now, I don't know about you folks, but dogs don't look like that where I come from. And then it said it's a person holding a cat. OK, finally, recently it began to say, ah, that's a person holding a chicken. 
And then what about a famous landmark? Again, it recognizes that the Taj Mahal is there, but the reflection, the water seems to confuse it. And it ends up saying, oh, there's several things there. And I think that's just fascinating that I can recognize that. Now, I'm not going to do any more of them, folks, but you can play with them in the slide yourself. And um, the one thing I'm amazed by that I have to show you is that there is Blarney Castle in Ireland. It's in Cork. It's quite far away from where I am. But legend has it that if you're particularly if you're a tourist, if you kiss the stone up here, which you have to lean out and be held to kiss it, you'll be granted the gift of the gab and be able to speak and present just like an Irish person. Um, you know, with great confidence and and uh, no, no stage fright or anything like that. However, I think the fact that you're willing to lean out over the edge of the castle wall to kiss a stone shows that you're pretty confident already. So if you've ever gone to Cork, be sure to do that. Now, I'm going to go on to how do we code this? So for the last section, we're going to do a bit of code and it's not hard code and you absolutely can do this if you've done, ever done code before. The first thing I need to say is if you don't already have an Azure subscription, you can get one if you're a student or an academic for free. You get $100 for 12 months if you sign up at Azure for Students. That's aka.ms slash Azure for Students, F-O-R, not the number four. However, if you don't have it, don't go do it now. You don't have time to do it now, but you can do it later on. Sign up. Uh, you don't need a debit or credit card and you'll have $100 worth of Azure to play with. Uh, I've already done that, so you can watch me if you haven't done it. And if you've done it, you can do it. All the code is on GitHub. I've sent the link on to Eamon. You should be able to get it yourself. When you have the code, and I'm going to show the code here. Let me just pull up the code for you. Uh, when you oh, wrong one, here we go. So I'm just going to maximize this. This is my GitHub here. It's Stephen Dash Howell, not Stephen Howell with no dash. And down here we have AI for accessibility, vision AI captioning. Now I'm going to copy that into the chat. Oh, sorry. And here we go. Oh, Eamon is so on the ball already has it all pasted it's so impressive okay so you don't even need that so when we go down here we can see that i have a little command line program and you call it you tell it which api version you want to use i even have a hint about which one you should use and then the image you want to send okay so you can go get that now and look you can do this for free there's a free tier you do five thousand images a month if you manage to process more than five thousand images in a month i think it's 84 cent for every thousand images after that and you have a hundred dollars free so you should be good to go now i'm going to now switch back over and say okay so all i did in order to get the two things i need to run this program is i went into the azure portal now i'm doing this for the benefit of the people who haven't signed up yet once you're signed up to azure when you go into the portal, you'll be able to create a resource and then it lets you search. There's hundreds of resources, lots of different mad things, cool things, do strange things. You just want computer vision. Type in computer vision. It comes up computer vision from Microsoft. Hit create. It will bring you into a field where you really only need to specify the closest location to you. In my case, that's North Europe, which is a data center from Microsoft in Dublin, which is about an hour away from me. So that's the closest one. A unique name. So, you know, if the name you want is taken, you can always, you know, add a number or your name to it and it should be unique. And then finally, uh, how much you want to spend. So I would suggest you go with the free tier because you're a student, you want to keep your cost down. Then once it's finished creating it, which takes about a minute, click keys and endpoint. And then there's a big secret button and you can see here it's secret show keys and it'll unhide the key so you can copy and paste it. Now I'm going to show you my key today. You're saying, Stephen, don't do it. We'll be able to steal your key and go crazy with it. Yes, but I'm going to delete the key, which is very easy to do as soon as this event is over. And that way I can continue using my credit and be confident that you're not running away with all my credit because you have my secret key. Now, that's because I'm doing a demo. I know to do that. Remember, when you're doing your own projects, don't upload your secret key to GitHub. 
or wherever you upload your code. Don't post it on Stack Overflow or, or anything like that, OK? So keep that key secret. Now you're going to see mine today because I know you're going to see it, and I know when I'm presenting it's visible, but you should not show the key and the endpoint to other people because they could take it and start using your credit in the event that it wasn't a free key. And even if they used up all your free image searches or captioning, then you won't be able to use them because you shared it. So watch out for that. OK, now if you do have the portal, you've probably done that already yourself. So what I'm going to do next is I, I'd rather leave that code there and actually go to code inside Visual Studio Code. So if you're watching this later on and you have the slides and you're saying, oh, like this code looks very hard, rather than talk about code on a slide, I want to go to Visual Studio Code. Is that OK? And I left that slide in for the people who were not going to be able to um, attend this live. So I'm now going to switch over to our code. And there we are. OK, and you can see that I don't have to import very much. The important one is requests. You have to install pip install requests. Then I have my subscription key and my endpoint. And they're the two things I was just telling you about that I got off the Azure portal. I went in there and I said, please create a, a computer vision resource. And I said, what do you want to call it? I said, AI for accessibility, because I was doing this talk. And then it said, right, there's your secret key. There's your endpoint. Off you go. And I copied them and I pasted them in here. And when you get the code off GitHub, that's exactly what you do. Then I have, because I'm old school, I like to tell people when they try to run my program and it goes horribly wrong, what they did wrong. So what this will do here is it will say, this is how you use the program, and it'll give you some advice. OK. Now, at this point, I'm going to stop. I'm going to go down here. And I'm going to say, watch what happens when I type py, caption.py. We'll go with uh, version 1.0 of the API, and we'll type 1.jpg. OK, now you might say, what's 1.jpg? OK, well, if I click here, it's Molly again. Remember Molly? So that's 1.jpg. And I'll press Enter down here, and it prints out the result a little girl sitting in the field. And the first thing it prints out is the API version I used to remind me, and then how confident it was. Now, that didn't change much between API 1 and 3, because I bet you will get the exact same result. But then there was a big change. They changed the algorithm and the model. And for version 3.1, a child sitting in a field of wheat. And the same here for version 3.2. It's now a child sitting in a field of hay, or a girl sitting in a field of hay. So you've just seen me run it live. How did the code work? Well, I can go over here. And the first thing we do is we say, OK, make sure that we have an input file argument on our command line, the API version argument on our command line, and then split the file up. If it's not a JPEG or a ping, uh, say, uh, please specify a JPEG or ping file. OK, so that's the only two files it works with. If they did specify that, make sure it's under four megabytes, because if it's over four megabytes, it'll be rejected by Azure. It has to be under four. Assuming we got that far, we read the image into a byte array. So we end up with image data, which is all the bytes of our image, our photograph, our painting, whatever it is. Then this bit is probably the trickiest bit if you're not used to RESTful API calls. I'm going to just highlight it. So what this code does, is it says create the headers, which are kind of like the information we need to send with the call. And they have things like my key, uh, what type of information I'm sending, what type of information I want to get back. So we have parameters. And this is the bit that you'll probably change as you're experimenting with this. I have other examples up on GitHub you can use as well. So this here specifies that I want to get a description back, and in description is the captions, and I want the caption. But if I wanted the tags, which is the list of objects it thinks it sees in the picture, or the list of where they are, or to test if there's any text in the image and copy it out like OneNote does, I would change that word there to be a different word, like tags or categories. And there's a, there's a long list of them. But right now, I just want description. Bear in mind, you shouldn't just list all of them for fun, because you're charged in image lookup, a feature lookup, 
for every single one you use. So even if it's only one photograph, but you check 10 things, that counts as 10 of your image free image lookups in a given month. So only ask for the ones you need. Next, I build the URL, which is my endpoint slash vision slash V slash the API vision slash analyze. And all that is is sticking all the bits together to get the final one we want. And then we send it off as a request. We wait for the result to come back, which is JSON, and then we chop it all up and get our caption out. And once we have our caption out, we print it out with a confidence that those three lines there don't really need to be spread out like that, but I did it to make it easier to understand. Then we print out the caption and we could shorten it. It's 39 lines of code. We could take out the comments. We could take out how to run it. We could take out all the nice variables and we'd probably have it down to 25 lines of code, but, but harder to understand. So I like having it this long. So I can, I've loads of different images here. We're going to pick one we haven't used already. So I have different ones here, I think. Uh, one we, ah, so this is a, a picture from a game called Red Dead Redemption. So I took a snapshot of the game when I was playing, and this is an image of me being a cowboy going around on my horse, not in real life now in the game. And this image is 12.ping. So I can say, uh, show me, caption this picture from a computer game. Now it doesn't know it's a computer game. Oops, sorry, excuse me, ping, not JPEG. There we go. So it will say, oh, that's a horse standing on top of a grass covered field. That is, yeah, yeah, it is a horse, but there's more to it than that. What else is there? Let's go up one level on the API. A person riding a horse in a field. Yeah, but I've missed out now on my lovely grass. We go for the last one, folks. And it captions that one. What will it think of this one? It's a person riding a horse in a marsh. I think that's probably the best one. It does look a bit marshy. Now, folks, we have six minutes left, so I'm going to say bye bye to the code. I hope you enjoyed that. The code, I hope you agree, is simple enough. You can get SDKs that wrap a lot of this stuff, but I just want to say that Oh, wow, Rory, Rory, I really appreciate that comment, um, especially coming from someone in the role you have. That's that's excellent. So I'm going to go on to uh, the final thing and say, folks, thank you. We all also all Microsofties have to go now. We have a big event coming up in five minutes that might be nearly more important than my talk. But I'm just going to end with I can take questions for five minutes. There is a survey. I would love you to fill in that survey. This is my first reactor talk. I really enjoyed doing it. I'm obviously talking about something I'm passionate about and I get to show code and talk to students and experts and it was really cool. But if you fill in that survey, the reactor might even invite me back. And if you hated my talk, you can just forget to fill in the survey. No, I'm only kidding. Folks, I can take, uh, oh, sorry. I thought it was an exclamation mark uh, when you pasted it into me, but maybe you were just really excited at the time. I'm so sorry. Uh, so ignore the exclamation mark. Um, the event code is just a number, no exclamation mark. My apologies. And uh, what I want to say now is for the last couple of minutes, five minutes, I can take questions. You can either type them in or you can come off a uh, microphone and ask them. But I think at this point, we should probably stop the recording. I'll say I've been Stephen Howell. I hope you really enjoyed it. Thank you to Microsoft Reactor and the Higher Education uh, Student Series for inviting me for this test.